Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Ms. Catherine Evans, a lawyer and patron, Punaka Taturu Women's Counseling Center for Cook Islands, and she will speak on the topic, Cook Islands Family Protection and Support Act 2017, the successes and challenges. I now invite Ms. Evans to the floor to make her presentation. Ms. Evans, you have the floor. You have 20 minutes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn off my um, video because we have to listen to what I have to say then to look at me. So um, I'll turn my video off and put up, put up my um, uh, PowerPoint, um, which uh, is really a summary of uh, our legislation. Um, and it's been really interesting listening to offer uh, and uh, in particular in relation to access to justice. And I'll touch a little bit on that as well. Um, so I'll just turn my video off. The Cook Islands Family Protection and Support Act um, 2017, very recent piece of legislation, quite a comprehensive piece of legislation. Um, it was um, the result of uh, about seven years work uh, from 2010 um, by the uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs in the Cook Islands and Whenunga Tauteru Incorporated, of which now, but I wasn't then, I'm a patron. Um, and those two organisations worked really well together, collaborated in order to produce this new piece of law. So if we can change, turn the page. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about um, part six of the act, which is uh, the domestic violence part, but it's important to also know that this legislation includes things like child support, spousal support, uh, includes um, uh, the de facto relationships as being recognised, but de facto relationships only between um, uh, heterosexual couples. So couldn't get quite past the same sex relationships uh, when this is passed um, in law. Um, but um, it also includes, uh, this legislation includes care and protection of children. It includes divorce procedures and um, parenting arrangements. But the main uh, topic I'll talk about is the domestic violence. You can change the page. Yes, yeah, so the Cook Islands uh, family laws were um, passed by the New Zealand Parliament back in uh, 1915 after the um, British, British col uh, colonial uh, administration handed over to the New Zealand administration. And um, our, our fundamental laws were passed by the New Zealand Parliament and in the Cook Islands Act 1915 included land laws, but also included family laws, such as um, divorce, non-molestation, etc. Um, and then the uh, Family Protection and Support Act in 2017 repealed a lot of those laws uh, or amended them um, and uh, set up a, a comprehensive piece of legislation, including domestic violence. Um, <clears throat> the meeting in 2010 was um, set up and some of you, I think Offa was there, but some of you may remember it um, uh, being set up by UNDP and RRRT in Fiji. Um, and it was the foundation really for um, the uh, change in family laws here in the Cooks. Uh, but it took us a while to do, while other countries such as Vanuatu and Fiji, Tonga and Samoa were way ahead of us in terms of getting their legislation passed. It took us a while to do that. Um, and so we're only just recently uh, learning uh, the impact of um, the, uh, the ability for uh, survivors of domestic violence to um, seek um, assistance. And as Ofa said, the, um, the start of that is when they, a survivor decides that she's had enough and she wants to um, find some help. And so Usually that's at our uh, Punanga Tauteru Incorporated Society Women's Counselling Centre, uh, which right now is coordinated by Rebecca Buchanan, and or they go to the Ministry of Internal Affairs Gender Division for assistance there. 
So just a bit more now on part, uh, on part six, domestic violence. Thank you. So the legislation defines a domestic relationship in section 90. Um, and so the, a domestic rel relationship uh, is the important thing for a lawyer or for a helping organisation to establish when they are talking with a person who's talking about needing to survive um, a relationship. Uh, the important thing is to work out, is this a domestic relationship or not within the definition of the Act? Um, so uh, it is if it's a, a married couple or a couple in a de facto relationship, um, which is not same sex. But that can be that can be fixed by other definitions of domestic relationship, uh, which uh, is a very broad definition in the Cook Islands legislation. So a person who's in a close personal relationship with the other person is in a domestic relationship and would be able to apply for protection orders. So there I think you would have same-sex relationships being able to be addressed and being able to obtain a protection order if, um, if required under the legislation. Um, if a person who is a survivor has a child with the other person, they don't necessarily need to be in any other kind of relationship, but they have a child with the other person, they, can, they come within the definition of domestic relationship. If they're a domestic worker for the other person, so you might have a nanny or you might have um, a, a gardener or a cleaner or somebody like that and, uh, who's, who's working domestically for the other person, then they would, would, that would come in within the definition of a um, domestic uh, relationship. Um, where there's a person who's dependent on the other person because of a disability, illness or impairment, then they would be in a domestic relationship with the offender. Where a person shares a recent or recently shared a residence with the other person. So there you've got people who are flatmates. Um, you just have to have been sharing a residence or are sharing a residence now, and you would be come within the, within the definition of domestic relationship, be able to apply for um, a protection order. Or if um, if it's a child who ordinarily resides with um, a person who's the abuser or regularly resides or stays or resided or stayed with the other person. Um, so those, so that's the definition of domestic relations. As you see, very broad, takes account of a number of kinds of relationships where people would be um, able to apply for a protection order if there was domestic violence uh, within that relationship. Um, now, the uh, family member of the other person in our, in our communities, of course, is very broad. So we've got um, many generations. Uh, we've got third, fourth and fifth cousins who we know. Um, and uh, this legislation has been used where there are people who are related to each other, they're a family member and they're having a dispute over land um, and, it, and it becomes physical or it becomes um, within the definition of what domestic violence is. So very broad piece of legislation. Thank you. So there, there are a number of um, um, domestic violence, uh, or the de definition of domestic violence it includes the usual physical, sexual and economic abuse, emotional, verbal or psychological abuse and stalking, but it also includes causing death of or injury to an animal. Um, and when we went um, back in 2000 and I guess 12, about that time, the select committee um, went to the Pa Inua, uh, went around the villages to talk about what the de definition of domestic violence is. Um, and people's reaction was, well, we, we always, you know, kill our pigs for our food and our animals and our goats for our food. So how does causing death of or injury to an animal, you know, be, how can that be domestic violence? And when it was, when, when, when we started talking about, well, you know, sometimes that people will do that to a pet, um, or an animal that's very, very much loved by um, by a person, and 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 that animal is um, strangled or killed or, or or seriously injured as a way of hurting that other person. Then people started to actually understand that. Um, people started to respond with, "Yeah, actually, that is a thing." Um, and so they didn't, they weren't so um, so concerned about it being included as um, domestic violence. Um, then you've got behaviour which reasonably causes a person to fear injury or damage to property. 
Um, so that's where you've got um, people who, you know, break other people, as you know, break other people, break people's things uh, to hurt them. Um, causing or allowing another person to do those things above, so getting someone else to do those things, um, or threatening them, um, and doing any other any of the things above to cause the person to be afraid. And then, of course, there's the whole thing about, well, it only happened once, so is it really that serious? Um, so the legislation defines domestic violence as it can be a single act or it can be a pattern of behaviour um, over time and it constitutes domestic violence. So um, uh, you, if you're able to um, uh, prove any of those things, um, then you, we would be applying for a protection order for a person. So stalking is, is something that has to be sort of like, I think it's uh, two, two occasions of stalking um, and a person is, um, is at risk of um, having a protection order made against them for stalking. Yeah, so the legislation, uh, like uh, many of the le you know, uh, legislation around the Pacific, provides for police safety orders, um, which are issued by the police. Um, and if domestic violence has been committed or there uh, is reasonable grounds of fear of domestic violence, uh, they don't need to have the consent of um, the protected person. Um, and they must make a police safety order in respect of a child if domestic violence is committed and or child's welfare is likely to be adversely affected by domestic violence. Uh, but there can't be a, a, a PSO against a um, child who's under 16. Um, a person who is issued with a PSO must immediately surrender weapons and vacate the property. Uh, there are mandatory conditions that are attached to PSOs about you know, be, making contact with the person. Um, important that you know the service is affected by the police and the police have, must explain what the PSO is for and what it does and what the person can or can't do. So they, they are enforceable or they expire after up to five days. So sometimes the police will issue them for two or three days or they'll issue them for the whole five days. Um, to give the person who's um, needing protection time to uh, seek some legal advice or uh, go to uh, uh, the Pūnanga Tōtu or Ministry of Internal Affairs for help. Um, <clears throat> we have found that the police have um, been readily using um, PSOs, uh, but I have got some statistics um, as well from the police about that. No, uh, understanding also that our population is small, so we have 10,000 people living on Rarotonga, about, and we lost a few over the COVID time to people going over to New Zealand to work, and um, there's about um, 14,000, 15,000 people in the country in the whole, as a whole. So when we talk about being able to serve people with documents, not so difficult because we police pretty much know where everybody lives uh, or, or won't take long to find people because of that, um, of the size of our country and the, and, and the um, size of our population. So the police um, provided me with um, two years information, uh, 2020 and 2021, on the issuing of um, uh, PSOs. So you can see that the uh, top left um, diagram has uh, the number of, of, of domestic violence incidents over that year was 73, which is not very high when you think of other countries around the Pacific, but when you think of our population, that's a, that's a number. Um, and the number of PSOs that they issued was seven. Um, to the right at the top there um, is the, um, 100% of the offenders were, were men. Um, and then you've got um, the number of victims involved to the bottom left, two children, seven women, uh, two men, um, and the age groups of the victims. And then you've got the reasons. Now, because time's running out, I'm going to need to flick on to the next um, diagram, next page. So there's 2021. And you can see there's a big jump in uh, the number of PSOs issues in, issued in 2021 compared to 2020. Um, so you've got 69 uh, DV incidents in, uh, compared to 70 in 2020, but you've got 30 PSOs. 
So discussions with the police indicate that the, uh, they've had um, a fo refocus of um, their work towards um, domestic violence and responding better to the domestic violence complaints. Um, so that's uh, increased their um, involvement and issuance of PSOs over that time. There's a number of factors in that they've said, um, but because of time, I need to move on to the next slide. Yeah, so there's the ways that um, people can apply for a protection order is, you know, by uh, phone to the registrar, um, by um, email, uh, and then by going in and filling in a form. There's no forms at the moment online with the Ministry of Justice website, so that's something that needs to happen. The problem we've got is that people who live in the Pa Inua, out in the outer islands, um, have very little ability to apply for protection orders, even though the legislation enables them to do it. Um, it's just not happening um, as much as we hoped it would when we uh, when the um, legislation was passed uh, to enable it to be easier for people in the Pa Inua to apply for protection order. Temporary protection orders um, are made uh, on a without notice basis and they're made for um, uh, three months. After three months, if there's no challenge to the temporary protection order, they become a final order. Um, and they are, of course, remain a final order until they're discharged by the court at some point in the future. Um, temporary protection orders have to be served within 24 hours of them being made. Uh, we've had, I think, two that the police didn't manage to get served within that time frame, and that was really at the beginning when they were not sure, not too sure about what they're supposed to do. But uh, we found that been really very helpful and getting TPOs served as soon as they're made and delivered to the police station. Um, of course, there's the usual mandatory conditions and, and also about weapons. There's also um, you can also apply for occupation of residence. We have a different situ situation here in terms of land ownership. Um, we do have, the legislation has provided that um, a person can be, there can be a condition on a protection order that enables a person to to uh, stay in the home, um, despite the fact that the home might belong to other, other you know, landowners are, are, are from the other side, um, from the perpetrator side. Um, so that's been included and we haven't really yet had any challenge to that, but we may well do in the future. There's also provision for compensation to the protected person for loss, uh, for them having to find other accommodation if they're going to do that, um, for, for injuries to themselves. Thank you. Uh, this is the number of protection orders that are processed by the court for 2020 and 2021. Um, so, um, I have to wrap up now, so if you can, um, you're welcome to, to have a copy of the, this document and compare those, um, uh, those, uh, those tables. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Evans, for that presentation. Uh, we apologize. Uh, sorry, because we're strict on time, but that was a wonderful presentation. And um, a lady and do have any questions, I'm sure you as well. So, to learn more on the Family Protection Support Act um, Island, and uh, we will share with you as well her uh, email as well. Uh, thank you guys on that. So, um, thank you uh, very much, uh, Ms. Evans, for uh, sharing on the uh, successes and the challenges with relation to the Protection Act of Cook Islands. And thank you for the great and marvelous work that you continuously uh, do. Best wishes to you. And once again, Binako Bakalevo, and thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Ms. Joanne Dasman. Uh, she is the Human Rights and Social Inclusion Advisor for the Pacific Community, SBC, and she will speak to you today on the topic, Identify Gaps in Protection Orders and Future Priorities for Action. And this will be a case study of Samoa. So I will now invite Ms. Gassman to the floor to make her presentation. Ms. Gassman, you have the floor. You have 20 minutes, ma'am. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, William. I hope everyone can hear me okay. It's raining here in Suva, so uh, it's a little bit loud on the roof, but um, I am just very honored to be a part of today's symposium, and I am very excited about all of the stuff that we've been hearing, and I hope um, to just continue to add to the wonderful information that we've had. Uh, so this is just going to be a quick case study on Samoa and a little bit about the interesting work that's happening on the ground there and, and hopefully how other Pacific Island countries might be able to copy um, and, and really work um, lessons learned in Samoa um, moving forward. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a brief overview of what we'll go through, a quick background and introduction, and then some deep dive into a little bit more of the nitty gritty with a conclusion. Next slide. Um, so some important backgrounds um, and information. I think you can probably tell from my accent that I um, am not from Samoa <laughs> myself, but I was in Samoa in 2014 and 2015, where I had the great privilege of assisting the Office of the Ombudsman in the first State of Human Rights Report, um, as I was a Fulbright Public Policy Fellow with the office. Um, so we did some incredible work of going out into the community and, and speaking with children um, of villages that were far out, people that aren't often consulted in processes like these because you know the office um, which is also the National Human Rights Institute was really truly all about getting out there and, and speaking to the community listening and garnering what it is that Samoan people wanted for something like a status of human rights report to to do and um, I think the wonderful work that the office has done is really been shown that after the 2015 Status of Human Rights Report, there was an impetus for the very first historic national public inquiry into family violence in Samoa, because one of the main takeaways of the State of Human Rights Report was the pressing issue of gender-based violence and family violence, um, particularly towards um, women and girls. And so it really is, um, a sort of prime regional example of an impetus for change coming from the state itself and through the you know the work that's being really done so importantly on the ground in that state you know rate so i am here speaking in that capacity um you can see i shared a picture that's me speaking with some students um i you know it was just a really wonder probably as a human rights lawyer one of the best experiences um i was able to have so that is the, the background and introduction. Next slide, please. Um, we've had a lot of discussion um, you know, about protection orders and, and family violence. And I think there's two really important things that uh, it is important to go back to, especially when thinking of it through the lens of law. Um, you know, given the nature of family violence, rarely is a perpetrator's actions contained to one person. Right, you know, this is something that is truly family wide. This is something that is community wide. And if we're going to go about solving the problem at its core, um, those are some things we need to recognize that law really isn't, um, you know, set up to handle as well as, say, what the crisis centers are doing on the ground. So when we're able to make sure that the you know, realities of the ground or what's informing the laws and policies that go towards solving the problem, we get a lot farther. And I think Samoa is a great example of showing how this can be done. Secondly, we know that contemporary family protection acts are designed to address situations of sort of immediate danger. And so in many ways, protection orders act more as a band-aid to the larger problem than a solution that gets to the problem's core. And I think, you know, the previous um, examples and, and, and presentations given from the crisis centers on the ground are, are a perfect example of this. So one of the things that uh, is a huge lesson learned or, or something to take away from what Samoa has been doing is really trying to bridge that gap of what is happening on the ground and what laws and policies can actually do to uh, narrow those gaps. Next slide, please. So protection orders in the Pacific, just generally, we had a nice um, big wide overview from my colleague, Neil Mai, earlier on today. Um, it's really come a, a long way in, in the decade plus that, that this has been happening. Um, but I wanted to go specifically into some of the gaps that we have identified through today's discussions. Um, next slide. 
So what are they? We know that there's been um, fairly narrow application um, and that especially when there are barriers within the law itself that states that you know it's only in marital status situations and not other forms of partnership. Thank you so much, Catherine, for speaking about you know issues of, of same-sex couples and and you know or the idea that it it goes beyond just you know even a partnership. There's other forms within the family itself. Um, one of the great things that Samoan National Inquiry into Violence also uncovered was a lesser talked about issue of sort of the male on male violence, brother versus brother, cousin versus cousin, things like that. Um, and those tend to get overlooked um, a lot when just understanding the nature of family violence um, generally. We know that the laws have also been taken directly from a colonizing country without regard for sort of local customs and context. I think a lot of the Pacific Island countries have done well to try to um, address this issue, but there's still much to be learned from. I think it's also really important to recognize that even in the countries that have started, you know, protection orders, we still have a far way to go ourselves in, in, in making sure that violence against women and family violence is actually something that law can um, address in an appropriate manner. We know that uh, one of the major um, thing, gaps that was identified both from the status of human rights report to the inquiry on national violence in Samoa is the fact that witnesses to family violences are not, um, protection orders aren't applicable in those cases. And we know that often family members themselves, children being the main um, parties to that are often witnesses of family violence that um, are not necessarily covered. Uh, and so lastly, um, like we've been talking about, there really is poor public knowledge of even understanding that this like a local legal mechanism exists, let alone how to access it. This is especially applicable to rural and outer island um, uh, outer islands that we've seen, you know, without the understanding of this as an, as an even something that's possibility, you're not going to get people to use it. Next slide, please. So Let's talk specifically about what is happening in Samoan protection orders and things that have been done and been put in place um, that may be helpful. So next slide. We have, um, in, since the Family Act of 2013 that provides for protection orders, a total of 378 interim protection orders were lodged and approximately 82% were made permanent. Um, and we know that the use of protection orders, however, remains low when compared to the rates of violence that we know um, exist and uh, are staying constant um, and are jarringly high. There's, uh, you know, the WHO report that came out um, a while back that showed that upwards of 46% of women aged 15 to 49 years old have experienced some form of violence, either sexual um, and physical, um, often perpetrated by their partners in Samoa itself and, and you know, similar rates across the region. So when we see these rates and, and we know that this form of, of legal protection is it matching um, you know, the realities on the ground? That's where it's really important to start to ask, okay, how do we start to bridge these gaps? And um, Samoa's uh, inquiry into, into family violence gives some great examples of what can be done. Next slide. So needed expanded, the need for expanded protections. We know that um, in Samoa, one of the main recommendations given in the inquiry um, into family violence was to empower the village FONO, village family safety committees, to play a direct role in protection of individual cases of family violence through either provision of shelter for victims or the appropriate penalties for perpetrators. Um, this is really about bringing it into the local context of what can be done. Um, and we also know that from the 2016, sorry, 2015 uh, human rights report that much of the people who were, who even knew that protection orders existed, many of them were very, uh, afraid to even use it knowing that retaliation was going to be a common thing and that they don't have protection from that. So when we know that retaliation from an abuser is a common response to a protection order, but little exists to track or reduce this dangerous response, we, that also adds to um, you know, a barrier to access. 
one way to get above that is to do what Samoa is doing and really encourage community to be a part of the solution. Um, so I want to be quick because I know we're behind time and I, you, know, you don't need to hear from another lawyer like me, but I think one of the wonderful things and something that can be done is to use the example in Samoa where the impetus for change is coming from communities themselves um, and really trying to encourage that behavior to make sure that the laws can reflect the realities of what's happening on the ground, that we identify these gaps and begin to close them and then share information about what is important and how that can be done. I think that's why the symposiums like this are so important. Um, and I thank all of my colleagues uh, for helping to, to get this together. And I am happy to answer any and all questions. So thank you. I went quickly, William. Yes. I, wanted, I wanted to get back on track. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Johanna. Yes, we're on track. We're just two minutes into uh, almost one. So. Um, just I uh, want to thank you both. So uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Gassman, for that wonderful uh, presentation. And thank you for highlighting uh, the identified gaps in protection orders and uh, future priorities for action with relation to the case study for uh, Samoa, and which is quite relevant to the experiences or context in the, in the Pacific. And Dinat Vakalevo, and thank you so much to you and to you too, Ms. Evans, for both being here today, uh, giving your time and the solidarity and commitment to being here and uh, to share on the nature of uh, family violence uh, protection orders in uh, Samoa and Cook Islands. And um, best wishes to you both, Dinat Vakalevo, and thank you.